Thank you, Herbert. Okay, without going into detail, I thank everyone. I thank everyone who had anything to do with this event on both sides of the Atlantic. I thank you for being here, and I thank my parents, without whom I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Boker Tov. This is the audience participation part. Boker Tov. Thank you. I'm Ellen Hershkin, the 26th National President of Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Organization of America. I'm delighted to be here today to introduce our next speaker, my longtime friend, Gil Troy. But before I do, I'd like to speak for just a few moments about the significance of this month, a month to celebrate the accomplishments of women the struggle for gender equity, and a time to take pause to celebrate the history of so many strong women who spent their lives working to make the world a better place. As has already been stated, the month of March is Women's History Month. Mar <laughs> March 8th was International Women's Day, and the United Nations holds its annual Commission on the Status of Women events over the next two weeks in March. Every year, as the world celebrates the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women, AZM brings forward an initiative called Femin Israel created to focus on and draw attention to the achievements of Israeli women and the world over. I had the honor of serving as a speaker at last year's Femin Israel at a panel among some of my most esteemed colleagues who are also here today. I commend AZM's commitment to spreading Zionist values every day and working to lift up the voices of women's organizations who work to make the state of Israel even greater. Although I reside in the United States, my heart is in the East. I lead with great pride an organization that is committed to the ideals of feminism and Zionism, two movements based on freedom, self-determination, civil rights, and more. Women's voices have always featured prominently in the Zionist movement, and I am proud to stand in this room during Women's History Month, which also happens to be the month of Hadassah's founding. In 1912, at Temple Emmanuel, not so far from here, a small group of women led by Henrietta Zold launched Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Organization of America, in the season of Purim, which usually falls during the month of March. We take strength from the memory of Queen Esther, whose Hebrew name was Hadassah, who reminds Jewish women and men worldwide of the power of resilience and of standing up for what you believe in, even when it's the hardest thing to do. Gloria Steinem, world-renowned feminist, journalist, and activist, once explained, and I quote, the story of women's struggle for equality belongs to no single feminist, nor to any one organization, but to the collective efforts of all who care about human rights, unquote. So it is my pleasure to be here among so many organizations working to ensure that women's voices, along with our dedicated male counterparts, remain prominently featured in the Zionist movement. I know we need to shift focus to our next speaker, so it is my sincere pleasure to introduce Gil Troy. His bio is in your program, so I won't proclaim his myriad accomplishments since we would be here all day. We will be here all day, but we have other speakers to engage. 
Gill is an award-winning author and historian whose recent work, The Zionist Ideas, Vision for the Jewish Homeland, Then, Now, Tomorrow, has garnered great acclaim as an important update to Arthur Hertzberg's 1959, The Zionist Idea. In Natan Sharansky's foreword for the book, he writes, quote, this magnificent work is the perfect follow-up to Arthur Hertzberg's classic, The Zionist Idea, combining, like Hertzberg, a scholar's eye and an activist's ear. Gil Troy demonstrates that we now live in a world of Zionist ideas, with many different ways to help Israel flourish as a democratic Jewish state, unquote. I'd be remiss not to note that unlike Hertzberg, Gill's work includes women Zionist thinkers. I've known Gill for many, many years as he is a product of Hadassah's Young Judea, our Zionist youth movement, now independent. His commitment to educating the world on Zionism, offering thoughtful and unique perspectives, are a treasure to our community. Here to speak to us today about the future of Zionism in America straight from Israel, I give you my dear friend, Gil Troy. Booker Tov. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you to everybody you thanked, uh, including your parents. That'll cover it all. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here and to mark, for me personally, a, an important milestone, which is that a year ago in a week, uh, I came out with this book, The Zionist Ideas. And I, I don't want to repeat my shtick. Uh, I've done that. Uh, when I started, I said, if I am able to launch 70 different salons, Zionist salons, across the world in the course of this year to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the State of Israel, I feel like I've succeeded, and I think I've exceeded that number. Um, and, and that's been very, very gratifying. And you know, historians have a healthy appreciation of their own insignificance. But we also have a certain kind of grandiosity. Because again and again, we're always reading about these great heroes in history. And so throughout this year, I've been kind of struggling uh, with Yalag, Yud Lamed Gordon. On some days, I think of his early poem, Hakitza Ami, wake up, wake up, wake up, my people. Where he's so excited by modernity. He's so excited by the dream of what ultimately comes, the American dream, that he's saying, please join me. And within a few years, Yalag said, Lemi ani amel, for whom do I toil? And there have been highs and there have been lows. Highs. I walk around and I see on people's faces how excited they are when I give them an opportunity to talk about Israel, not in the context of BB or BDS or the Palestinians. I was at the JCCA conference the Jewish Community Centers of Association of America conference in Memphis. And um, a woman, we had a whole session on Zionism. And fortunately, they started the session with a, a series of awards. So that kind of pulled everybody in. And a woman afterwards comes up to me. And she says, I didn't want to come today. I didn't want to talk about Israel. I certainly didn't want to talk about Zionism. I'm so fed up with Bibi and the Palestinians and the occupation, I can't talk about this anymore. And she said, I appreciate the fact that you invited me into a conversation not about the Zionist idea, but about the Zionist ideas. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's the theme of this conference, opening up the conversation from left to right, religious, non-religious, bringing people in. We have to be like Abraham's tent, red lines, define boundaries, but also open, and figure out ways to bring in as many people as we can without 
forgetting who we are. But there have also been sobering moments. I'm in Chicago. At a conference of Israel educators. And I give my shtick, which is that historically we have to organize the conversation. And the way I organized the conversation in my book, once we went from the Zionist idea to the Zionist ideas, was first the founders until 1948. And yes, we had women and we had Mizrahim. And then the builders from 1948 to 1998. And I said, who are we? And I said, we and you, speaking to younger people, we're not the nothings, as one friend of mine suggested. We're the torchbearers. We're the torchbearers because we're the heirs to this amazing tradition. And as in the Olympic relay, when it's passed to you, you have to keep the torch burning. You may go to alternate energy sources. You may figure out new approaches, but you continue in the relay. And afterwards, a 30, 35-year-old Israel educator comes up to me, and he said, every time you use that torch metaphor, and every time you use that word nationalism, and how can we explain Zionism without nationalism, all I heard was Trump, Charlottesville, and Nuremberg. I can't make this up. I always say I could never be a novelist because I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare imagine the things that go on. I just have a good ear. I remember this stuff. Right? So what happened? As soon as I said nationalism, as soon as I said torch, first of all, we live in the age not of listening generously, but of listening censoriously. People listen to be offended. People listen to be proved, ah, you see, that guy's an a-hole. But more than that, he was coming, and we've now created, we're now in a world where for 80% of American Jews, there's a second N-word, nationalism. And I would say, I don't understand how to explain America as an American historian without taking back the night about nationalism. So I've been going back and forth between my inspiration and my excitement at this new conversation and seeing young people turned on and seeing how quickly sometimes their educators are quick to turn them off. And I'm stuck by this anomaly. As I travel around, I always go back to the studies of Len Sachs at the Cohen Center, who indeed shows that the 20-somethings are often more connected to Israel, more pro-Israel than the 30-somethings. Why? Because more of them went on birthright. And yet, every time I open up the New York Times and the Forward, and every time I'm in one of these circles, all I hear about is how the youth are abandoning us. What's the truth? What's the disconnect? What's going on? Similarly, with Israel-Diaspora relations, I learned at the GA that Israel-Diaspora relations is code word for most American Jews for why Israel sucks and why I can use Israel as an excuse for why my kid is alienated and intermarrying and hating Judaism. It was all finger pointing in one direction. And even as we talk about this growing gap, I always like to tell the story of June 25th, 2017, when Benjamin Netanyahu pulled the rug out from under that Sharansky compromise vis-a-vis -vis the Kotel. And everybody's telling us, rupture, divorce, the gap between Israel and American jury has never been greater. And that very night, my son Yoni comes home from the Shuk, from Machane Yehuda. He goes, Abba, I couldn't get a drink. I couldn't get a seat. It was all crowded in the Shuk. And I said, knowing the answer, why? And he said it was filled with birthrighters. It's in June. And we know that birthrighters have two words when you say, what do you think about Israel? Awesome. <laughs> That's a joke, one, right? But what does that mean? So it shows that while we're building people-to-people -people ties, we also have these political issues. And one of the fundamental challenges in the Zionist movement is at what point do we focus too much on the political issues and forget the identity issues? On the other hand, do we focus so much on the identity issues that it looks like we're papering over the political divisions? And this division between what I'm calling the politicalists and the identitarians is one of the things we, as a Zionist movement, have to work through. But before I get to my agenda for the modern Zionist movement, I want to answer the question, or at least start exploring this question, 
of American Jewry and Zionism. And one of the metaphors that struck me over the last year, I know we always like to go to Eastern European Jewish metaphors, so pardon me if I use a Mizrahi Israeli metaphor. My favorite soup, or soups, kuba soup. You take kuba soup, now I'm not a big chef, right? But you got the basic ingredients of the kuba, right? And if you put it in beets, it turns red. And if you turn it, if you put it in lemon, it turns yellow. When we talk about American Jews and Israelis, fundamentally, genetically, we're the same. Fundamentally, genetically, in terms of our life stories, in terms of our great-grandparents and our great-great-grandparents, we're the same. And we have to acknowledge that sameness, but we also have to acknowledge the steepness in two different soups. <clears throat> and notice, I'm very careful to take two soups that I find equally good. It's always very stressful. I don't know which one to choose every time I go out to, to, to Pinati. <clears throat> Within that, let's name two fundamental visions we see among most, not all, American Jews and among most, not all, Israelis. Israelis, I say, increasingly are Davidian and American Jews increasingly, especially the 80% who are liberal to left of center, Isaiahs. What does that mean? King David, at the end of the day, from the time he was a little kid, from the time he was a shepherd, from the time he was fighting Goliath, had one focus, survival. He had to survive in, off, in an often difficult environment, in a bad neighborhood. And Israelis, have to survive in an often difficult and ugly environment. And so Davidians understand patriotism. Davidians understand realpolitik. Davidians understand the fundamental core value of survival. Isaiah, the lion lies down to the lamb. Peace, universalism. We here in America, as American Jews, are blessed with an opportunity to focus, and actually the truth is we only read the good parts of Isaiah, <laughs> to read those parts and to build our Jewish identity on that. Now some of us take it too far and we end up with tikkun olamism, with seven A's in the middle, where we take one value and we make that the premier value. Now again, those of us who know David's story also know that David had the harp and David did the Psalms. And to just caricature him as a survivalist misses the complexity of David. Similarly, as I already suggested, and now we have learned rabbis here, if we read the whole book of Isaiah, we also learn about nationalism. But what's the point? It's helpful sometimes for the Davidians to be reminded about the Isaiah values, especially when we're at the worst moments, when we're being attacked, when we're under the gun. And it's helpful for Isaiahs to be reminded of their Davidian obligation and their Davidian patriotism. Not to be, as Mama Troy warned, so open-minded your brains fall out. And so that's, if we can understand and label the different impulses and see convergence as well as divergence, see opportunities to learn from one another as well, then we'll see, okay, both kinds of kuba soup work. Connected to that is a new kind of mutuality. 30 years ago, you couldn't criticize Israel, unless you were Israeli, and then you criticize Israel all the time. In the last 30 years, we've seen more and more American Jews feel comfortable criticizing Israel. And I think that's a mark of health in the relationship on one condition, that it's not a one-way street. But somehow, I've noticed that my friends in, American, in the American Jewish community, the more they feel free criticizing Israel, the less bandwidth they have for any criticism from Israelis or Zionists of American Jewry. And if we're really gonna have a mutual relationship, my left wing, because this is a left wing problem, I'm gonna pick on both sides, but this is a left wing crank, my left-wing American Jewish friends who are so quick to criticize Israel also have to maybe hear a little bit of a criticism, a Zionist critique, which we grew up with in the Young Judea Youth Movement, a Zionist critique of American Jewry. Because again, how else do we learn?
But we have to do it with love, we have to do it with respect, and we have to do it in a healthy way. So fundamentally, in building a new agenda for the Zionist movement, I'd like to suggest five key planks. First, we have to move from just political Zionism, which is important, just from defending the state and it perfecting the state, to now also using the state as an opportunity to not just critique American Jewry, but to build our identity, what I'm calling identity Zionism. And two ways of understanding this, if you think about the five schools of Zionist thought that I learned in Camp Tel Yehuda from the charismatic New Jersey educator Mel Reesfield, who would tell us, I need a black beard, I need a white beard, I need a hoe, I need a wheel. When we were talking about Zionism, we were going, what is wrong with him? He's off his rocker. He not only doesn't have his R's, but he doesn't have his, right? And what would he say? No, the black beard is Theodore Herzl. The white beard is Rav Cook. So political Zionism, religious Zionism, the hoe is social Zionism, labor Zionism. The wheel is a Haraam, cultural Zionism. And then we just make a fist for Jabotinsky, revisionist Zionism. And those are the five schools of Zionist thought. Those are the five schools that sang, Anubanu Artsa, Livnotu Libanotpa. But I've added a sixth, which is diaspora Zionism, which started in this organization and others with a kind of passivity of Artsa Alitem. You dumb clucks moved to Israel, we'll write the checks. But now, in a new conversation, the birthright approach, the new AZM approach has to be identity Zionism, where it's not only mutual, but we're also learning how to build identity together because we're all dealing with the same questions. How do I find meaning in this world? How do I find traction in this world? And Herbert, if I can recycle one thing from my usual shtick. The way I tell this, the way I try to prove this is through one of my favorite jokes. You know those light bulb jokes? So how many gurus does it take to change a light bulb? You don't need, you only have your inner light. How many therapy patients does it take to change a light bulb? You can only change if you want to change. How many men does it take to screw in a light bulb? One, he holds on to the light bulb and he thinks the whole world revolves around him. How many feminists does it take to screw in a light bulb? That's not funny. How many Zionists? The first three were set up so it wouldn't look sexist. How many Zionists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Five, one to screw in the light bulb. Two, to walk around singing and dancing, saying we've returned to the land and we're returning to our power. The fourth to write the check and the fifth to complain about the media coverage. That's the old school of Zionist thought. Our new school of Zionist thought is identity Zionism. Our new school of Zionist thought is where Israelis and American Jews and British Jews and Australian Jews and French Jews can sit down and ask the fundamental questions of who am I? And use the building blocks of a 3,500 year old conversation to bring meaning to our lives. I'm not arrogant enough to say that Zionism is the only way. But it kind of works. It's my way. It's rooted me, and it's rooted my kids in a story deeper than the me, 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 my, 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 more, 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 now, now, now impulses of the modern world, of the iPad, the iPod. So first is we have to have an identity Zionist revolution. Connected to that is we have to take back the night when it comes to that N-word, that second N-word nationalism. And there, we have to beware the left and the right. The pull of the left, our students finally get to university, and what are they told? That nationalism, is, is, that nationalism is for boobs and religion is for idiots, especially in the age of Donald Trump. You can love Donald Trump or hate Donald Trump, but when he puts his golden T on nationalism in Houston during the 2018 campaign, he says, I am a nationalist, say it, say it. My young friend from that Israel conference runs away from the word. And I say, no, how can you do that? But it feeds into this desire to be a citizen of the world. It feeds into this desire to escape the Davidian impulse. It feeds into this desire to go better. And the a notion, the American notion, that somehow you grow by leaving your community. What's the bar bat mitzvah ceremony? You take responsibility by growing into your community. We have to be countercultural. We have to fight this false postmodernism 
of the left, this false cosmopolitanism. We have to fight the fact that somehow it, the Jew particularly likes it. Again, one of my favorite jokes. It's from old traveling salesman in the 1930s, but I've updated it to a college freshman. Three years sitting around, and at a certain point, the conversation turns to religion. One of them says, hi, my name is Jane, I'm a Catholic. The other one says, hi, my name is Muhammad, I'm, an, I'm a Muslim. And the third says, I'm a citizen of the world. And they both go, oh, a Jew. Right? Because we want to we belong, we want to fit in. And my name is Gil Troy. I get great reception at Greek restaurants. I get it. But, but we got to stand up and we got to teach our kids. And you know what? We've seen it. Esther touched on this, that when the kids come to Israel and they see a different kind of pride, you can see it in their eyes. At the same time, we have to w be warned against the crude calculus of the ultra-right wing who simply say support for Israel is enough. And if it's not moral, and it's not balanced, and it doesn't also speak to the two parts of Jewish identity, which is the hardware and the software, which is belonging but also becoming better, which is believing in ideas, not just surviving, we will also fail. So that's our second challenge, balancing, beware the tikkun olamism of the left. But beware also that crude calculus of the far right. And Jews are Fitzgeraldian. F. Scott Fitzgerald said the mark of a true intelligence is the ability to hold two contradictory, contradictory thoughts in your head. My Rebbe, Mayor Ed Koch, taught me that he said, if you agree with me on seven of 12 things, please vote for me. If you agree with me on 12 of 12 things, please see a psychiatrist. <laughs> we need to accept complexity in a world that's pulling us one way or pulling us another way. No, our dance is we have two feet, a left foot and a right foot. We have two wings when we're birds to soar, a left wing and a right wing. We have our idealistic part, and we have our patriotic part. We have our Isaiah part, and we have our Davidian part. But unfortunately, too much of the Israel conversation is either the guilt trip. If you don't defend the Jewish people every time they're attacked on college campus and pull off your shirt and show that you have a big super Z or super Z underneath your shirt and says, I am a Zionist, then the entire Jewish project is going to come down. That's what we tell our high school students. That's what we tell our gap year students. Really? Is that what we want? On the other hand, we also teach in too many day schools, the kids are even showing up. Israel's this perfect place. Hava Nagila and blue and white flowers. The older I get, the more I realize that my most manipulative impulse and my most idealistic impulse meet. Because if you really want to teach resilient education, the brainwashers tell you you have to inoculate, and the moralists say you have to show complexity. And our form of Israel education all too often is far too simplistic. I was at Brandeis University, I called it a form of child abuse. Because in what happens, and it's also, it's short term, because they might feel good, but at the end of the day, the first time they encounter a roommate or a college professor who disagrees with them, the whole thing shatters. So we need to do a better job in Israel education. And of course, part of that is taking on this growing challenge of anti-Semitism. But three warnings, if I may. First, indeed, we do have to have that conversation, and I have handouts here where I'm trying to show how I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think through building off of Natan Sharansky's three Ds, how to build on that conversation, and, and help us make the case that, yes, if you demonize if you delegitimize, if you use double standards, that is a form of anti-Semitism, which is usually what the form that we see on the left. But also, I'm adding four H's. If you use the Holocaust or abuse the Holocaust, if you attack halakha, as they do in Stockholm, Sweden, if you play into this notion of Jewish hegemony, Jewish power, Jewish superherodom, or if you simply go back and use any of the old historic libels, those four H's I add to the three D's to say those two cross the line. That's my first point. My second point is that yes, theoretically, anti-Zionism can be distinguished from anti-Semitism, but you have to work really, really hard to do that. And that's not on me to decide. That's on the anti-Zionists to do. 
Why is it that in college campus, the burden is, already, is always on the speaker when it comes to feminism, when it comes to racism, when it comes to gay issues, but all of a sudden with anti-Semitism, we have to justify why it's unfair. It's on them. And you know what? Yes, theoretically you can make the case that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, but it's really, really hard to do, and most don't. And most, as we saw this week, go into what I call essentialism. You want to tweet about what Israel did in Gaza two nights ago? Fine, I'll disagree with you, but tweet away. But when you get to what the Jews do or what their lobby does, that's a kind of essentialism which isn't even about 3Ds and 4Hs. That's just good, old-fashioned bigotry. And shame on anyone who can't call that out. And I'm upset that the only people I heard really loud on this this week were named Engel and Lowy. I'm glad that they did it. But where's John Lewis, who's written so powerfully about Martin Luther King's understanding that anti-Zionism is a form of anti-Semitism? Where are our allies? We shouldn't have to do the heavy lifting. Our allies, at this moment of pain for us, should be stepping in. But my third warning about this is let us not let anti-Semitism attack the Zionist, uh, hijack the Zionist movement. It's too easy. It's too easy for us to say, you see, they hate us, therefore become Zionists. No. That's the old aliyah of rescue. Our world is an aliyah of choice. Identity Zionism is about making an affirmative stand and embracing Israel and embracing Jewish peoplehood because it's meaningful to us, not because they hate us. I will not let our enemies define me. I will not let our enemies define us. I will not let our enemies define the Zionist agenda. I'll fight hard. I'll fight intense. But I'll also keep it in proportion. A fourth connected to this is what we have to do, and it's the theme of this conference, is build a big, broad peoplehood platform. And that peoplehood platform has to be about patriotism. And through patriotism, finding a sense of principles, a set of principles, and through that, finding a set of purpose. But what's going on today especially in America, especially in elite American circles, is there's a new P that's undermining those lovely P's of patriotism and principle and purpose. Privilege. The privilege talk is making our kids feel automatically guilty. The privilege speak, first of all, ignores the fact of how many Jews are not wealthy, how many Jews are actually poor, how many Jews are middle class. It defines every Jew by Zuckerberg and Ginsburg. You're either super rich or super successful. And that's a form of anti-Semitism and a distortion in and of itself. But the whole white privilege conversation is basically a, an acid that's corroding our sense of Jewish patriotism and putting our kids on defensive. And we're not teaching that. Before we get to Zionism, before we get to the facts of how to fight for Israel, we've got to get to these fundamental underlying issues. And we've got to clarify, and I'm happy to welcome Len Sachs to the conversation. How much of what's going on is screechy noise by the loudmouths, what I call Peter Beinartism. Peter Beinart, 19, in 2010, writes an article without one reference to any survey and says, this is what liberal Jews are thinking. This is what kids are thinking. This is what he's thinking. And like every good intellectual, he thinks what he thinks represents what everybody thinks. <laughs> And how do, we recon how do we reconcile that gap between the numbers that we see in the Cone Center of happy customers, not just from birthright, but proud young Jews rallying around the flag? Len, you did an amazing study after the Gaza war, which had nothing to do with birthright, which showed that most American Jews on campus were, first of all, able to distinguish between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. They saw that they were experiencing anti-Semitism, anti not just anti-Semitism. And most of them didn't run away, but ran toward and stood up. But every time the New York Times writes an article about Israel and diaspora Jews, and every time we talk about it, all we do is quote Peter Beinart, JVP, and INN. So you know what we need? We need a new organization with a big Y in it. We used to have the AZYF, the American Zionist Youth Foundation. I need a youth voice. I need a voice pushing back and showing, no, wait a minute. <laughs> Something's going on here. We're alive. We're proud. We're thriving. 
Last year, 48,000 Jews participated in birthright. 13 stole spots from donors and walked off. And everybody knows their story, the story of the 13, not the story of the 48,000. I say shame on them, but also say shame on us for falling into that trap. And you know what else we need to do? We need to lighten the conversation. I'm so tired of the heaviness. I'm so tired of Israel, the hunchback and the furrowed brow. I'm so tired of starting every conversation with the latest crisis. Most of the time when I sit with college kids, and even with adults these days, I call them grown-ups. My wife is telling me, no, you have to call them adults. You know what I start with? If it's a group of 20 or less, I say, just go around the room and tell me your favorite Israeli. And the body language changes. They go from being like this to relaxing and joking and seeing the multidimensionality of Israel. And last year, when we were around the 70th anniversary, and I took advantage of both the Hebrew date and the English date, I started pushing for ice cream for breakfast on Yom Ha'atzma'ut. And I was in Atlanta three days before the American May 14th. And uh, I said this, and a bunch of uh, leaders of the Jewish day school there made sure that there was ice cream on Yom Ha'atzma'ut, and I got amazing feedback. In addition to, I hope, We'll, we'll launch more Zionist salons. I hope we'll launch more Zionist conversations. But I also hope that we will actually bring a touch of fun and love back into the conversation. So, to summarize, if I may, first of all, on your tables, I have my Ten Commandments of Zionist education, of how to approach Zionism. And I'm going to come take it because I had brought one up and somebody took it away. There's only one Zionist movement, right? We're united by our belief in the Zionist idea. We are a people. We have ties to a land. Doesn't preclude others having ties to a land, but we have ties to that land. And we have the rights to establish a state on that land. But that shall have many Zionisms. And when I talk about Zionisms, I'm talking about Femizionism, and gay Zionism, and Ethiopian Zionism, and eco-Zionism. And all these, what did we learn from the socialist Zionists? They took their core ideals, their core values, and didn't silo, oh, I have my Jewish side and my non-Jewish side. They put them together. And Zionism is a framework. It's a broad enough framework. And Israel is a framework, a broad enough framework to work that in. When I say that shall have no idols, beware idol worship. Beware making any one ideal so holy that we cannot speak to one another. Why can't my friends on the left and my friends on the right talk about social justice, and put their differences over the settlements aside. Why can't they find some things that unite them under the Koch rule of we'll agree on some things and disagree on others? We must be proud, but don't be vain. A little humility goes a long way. A little listening, a little openness is a good thing. When I say remember the Sabbath day, and all the dimensions make us a people in a religion and honor identity Zionism. It's more important to me that we talk about who I am. It's more important to me that we talk about how do I find meaning in life. It's more important to me that we find some kind of framework and that we fight the latest fight. We're not gonna win every propaganda battle. But I've seen it. I've seen it in kids' eyes. Natan Sharansky said something very profound the other day. He said, when I look at birthright students and I see this light, that we've already heard mentioned, it reminds me of the light that we had experienced in 1967, we as Soviet Jewish refuseniks. He says, obviously, one had their identity stripped from them. One is giving up on their identity. But that same sense of revelation, that same sense of excitement, that same sense of doubling down on your identity, and then from there, discovering your freedom and your human rights and your ideals is something that we can do. We just have to do a better job of passing it on. And one of the key ideas I've learned from Birthright, we call it person-centered education. And that was, again, also a Hadassah ideal and a young Judean ideal. It's not, as Buber said, I vow, but it, uh, it's not I it, it's I vow. It's interactive, it's personal. It's that personal touch. And don't be afraid of conversation. I invite people to ask the tough questions in these kind of forums. Because if we don't, <laughs> then where are we going to learn? And I'm not afraid, I always say, you know, I'm going to talk about identity Zionism, but I am not afraid of any question. Let's talk about the settlements. Let's talk about Bibi. Let's talk about the occupation here, together, and argue it out. I don't want to shut it down. I'm suffocating from the conversation where we're afraid to talk about anything. 
My friends on the right won't talk about anything. My friends on the left take every negative about Israel and use it to, to bash Israel. <laughs> Where's the intelligent conversation? Where's the ba balance? And let's make allies. Let's find new friends. I was in South Africa at the South African Zionist Federation meeting in Cape Town, and I looked at a multicultural space. I saw blacks and whites. I saw Christians and Jews working together, standing up for Israel in, by the way, the country that now has the lar world's largest Jewish community with the most hostile government toward Israel. It's something we really need to handle in a whole different conversation. And yes, of course, we have to steel ourselves against Zion anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. But as I said, we can't be defined by it. And never, never, never go down the path. Those are the last two commandments of immorality. Never, never, never give up on the truth for the perfect soundbite. And so to summarize it another way, I think we need identity Zionism. So give me an I. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. I think we need to strike against the far right and the postmodernist left. Give me an S. S. We need a resilient form of education, so give me an R. R. We need to fight against anti-Semitism, so give me an A. A. We need to educate toward a peoplehood platform understanding how corrosive this privilege attack is, so give me an E. e. And the ice cream for breakfast, the fun, reminds us of the L, love. Give me an L, love. What does that spell? Israel, what do we stand for? Israel, what are we going to bring back to the conversation as a tool, not just to help them, but to help us? Israel, thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Questions are short, pointed, and Canadian style go, hey. Hi. So I am Canadian born. Oh, look at that. So you, so you speak my language. Yeah. So I'm New York born, I should make it clear. The Pew study did a whole study on comparing Israeli Jews and American Jews, and, and they found that American Jews would be talking about values, whereas the Israeli Jews, because they live it, would talk about religion and history more. And I think that is part of, I think, the problem that we have, and how to connect. So that, you know, okay, I'll, 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 I'll summarize the question. Sorry, yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Do you want to? Do you want to? Uh, do you want to I was saying that the Pew study did a study to compare Israeli Jews and American Jews. And they found that when they asked them questions, a lot of the comments, I think, were on the American Jews talk about their values. And the Israeli Jews talk more about their religion and the history of the land. And I'm wondering how we can connect that and stop a divide in that area. Thank you for that. That's a very important question. So first of all, just one comment on the Pew study. The Pew study took, is, is, I understand it, and I, I did a fascinating class with a group of Israelis reading through the Pew study, and they took the same questions they asked more or less of the Americans and asked the Israelis. And one of the things that the Pew study didn't take into consideration, and after, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll go through an anecdote. A friend of mine reads the Israeli Pew study. She's lived in Israel for 30 years. She says, the Pew study in America showed that a high percentage of Americans associate, Jew associate a sense of humor with being Jewish. Israelis didn't. A high percentage of American Jews associated values with being Jewish. Israelis didn't. She went, I'm living in a country with no sense of humor? I'm living in a country with no values? I'm going, no, you're living in a country where the rabbinate has hijacked Judaism. So when, you were at, when the Israelis were asking that question, I did it in a class. They didn't do it systematically. I did it with 12 very smart kids. I asked them the questions. They asked it through the lens of their hatred of the rabbinut. So there was a distortion in that they were, they were really showing what they associate with the Jewish religion. Nevertheless, so that's my issue with the Pew study, but nevertheless, you're right. Look, I have an 18-year-old son, and he is in Mechina right now. And the big conversation among his buddies, the pre-military programs that are, when you say pre-military, you think West Point, don't think West Point, it's the complete opposite. He and his buddies are asking, what units are we going to get into? They're going through these zimunim and these call-ups, and, and, and I learned, do uh, you know what a schnitzel is? Yeah. You know, you think, you think you know what a schnitzel is. I learned what a schnitzel is. A schnitzel is when you're uh, trying out, as my son did, for the uh, Navy, 
and they throw you in the water at 6 a.m., and then they make you roll around in the sand, and you run around all day like a schnitzel, and then at night, you go back into the water, go back in with the sand, and then sleep in the sand. That's schnitzel. I'm learning a whole new thing. Now, so think of the experience that he's going through, and think of the experience that his cousin, his lovely cousin Ezzy, is going through in suburban Maryland. There's no greater divergence. And yet, what have we seen when we put 10 Israeli soldiers on a bus with 40 American Jews? Instead of getting into a Davidian Isaiah thing of, oh, look how great we are, we're sacrificing, and you are a bunch of spoiled Americans. Or, what brutes you are, and look how lovely and Isaiah we are. We see bonding. And the thing that nobody ever expected was we put the Israeli kids on the birthright buses as props, basically to make a, American Jews and Canadian Jews and British Jews have a good experience. We've seen that it's creating an identity revolution in Israel, too. So we have to do a better job of helping them understand that they can each learn from one another. That, yeah, they're one form of kuba soup and another form of kuba soup. And, and, and through education, we can do that. Through more people-to-people -people per programs, we can do that. Because what happens? Then it's personal. When it's impersonal, it's easy to hate BB and the Palestinians, the occupation. But it's personal. I saw when we made Aliyah, the first time there was violence, we all of a sudden started getting emails from cousins and friends, are you OK? It personalized it. It changed the conversation. It's not just about the New York Times, it's about your friends. And that's, that's the Jewish people glue. Yes, I saw there was a question here. Yes, sir. So first of all, I want to commend you for uh, your very eloquent uh, short oh, Thank you. You're going to get the $10 check from my mother every month for being so nice to me, so thank you. Truthful and, and really brave presentation. That's refreshing to hear on this side of that. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. My comment is you mentioned about the different Zionism, the white beard, the black beard, the whole so on and so forth, and you added a few of your own. But I must say, uh, as a representative of Bahavet Zion, the World Sephardic Zionist Organization, one Zionism I think you, you missed to mention, and that is the Sephardic Mizrahi Zionism, which I think is the most pure, religious, spiritual, historical, traditional, Jewish destiny Zionism that I think lacks in my government. So thank you for that. I'll, I'll bring you into my dilemma. I'll bring you into my educational dilemma. First of all, I'm very proud to say that uh, Arthur Hertzberg had 34 thinkers, no Sephardim and, and, and no women. And I, went, I have 168 co-stars in my Zionist ideas, and I added them, not as affirmative action, but as basic historic justice. So the question was, do I create a separate category, or do I integrate in the Mizrahi voice to religious Zionism, the Mizrahi voice through uh, the, poet, the poet Erez Biton into cultural Zionism, the, the modern Mizrahi voices to identity Zionism? And I chose, in the sake of Jewish unity, especially given that we're seeing a wonderful phenomenon in Israel that I know is an issue here, called intermarriage, right? And the more intermarriage we see in Israel between Mizrahim and Ashkenazim, the more we see these barriers breaking down, but also we see a whole new uh, paradigm when it comes to what everybody talks about, oh, the religious Israelis versus secular Israelis. Because I have good Ashkenazi friends whose parents and grandparents ate their, their, uh, their ham sandwiches uh, they, you know, their ham and cheese sandwiches on the beach on Yom Kippur or on Pesach, which, by the way, shows a, a fluency and a literacy that some of our kids lack, but that's a whole other conversation. And now they're married into Mizrahi families, and they're learning, you know, tradition can be good. So I'm totally with you, brother. My question is whether we hive it off as a separate one or we integrate it, and I chose to go integration, but thank you for that. Gave me a chance also to... Yes, I see. One, two, three. Yes. Ah. So we're going to the eastern okay, Sephardi, I'm going to let Alicia go. We have a western Sephardi uh -huh. uh, from the Iberian Peninsula, uh, etc. Uh, and the general Zionist, very uh, happy to hear what you have to say. This is the Zionist movement, though, and, uh, which is a political organization, we, but we do here is politics. And one of the obstacles, if you speak about the relationship between the Israelis or the diaspora Jews and Israelis as we arrived to the Zionist Congress after this whole process of elections, having four five years, and we fell into a job market uh, thing. And it is really stressful. 
So if we talk about creating interest in the Zionist movement, etc., 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 how can we really change things? Because we, as diaspora Jews, have hardly any interest in this job market we arrived to in Israel. It has to come from two sides. You spoke about our feelings here in diaspora. What about uh, the people who we are guests of, that's how they refer to us in Israel, because they have the job market. So thank you for that. Um, this allows me to call out uh, my friends Vernon and Karen, who years ago um, invited me to to give an early, early version of my Zionist thinking, based, based on my book, um, Why I'm a Zionist, to uh, the, two, I think two rounds ago, the World Zionist Congress. And then we did a, a, a post-conversation, and we discovered that many American Jews who had gone to the, 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 the World Zionist Organization with excitement came back traumatized. And what did they see? They saw what I saw the first time I saw it. They saw the Politburo. I, I'm just representing myself. Um, they saw a heavy-handed, you're absolutely right, job market. Now, the real question is, how do we take back the night? And I'll be honest, I, I chose not to put this in my remarks because I didn't want to distract from my, my core vision of identity Zionism. But uh, this summer, Natan Sharansky and I co-wrote an, uh, an article precisely about this issue, and precisely about looking for new structures where we can get diaspora Jews and uh, Israelis talking together. And we proposed a global Jewish council. And we were care now, Natan just finished being the head of the Jewish agency, we were purposely agnostic on the question of whether it should be through the World Zionist Organization or not. Because we're Luftmenschen. We wanted to just put out the need for a new kind of forum where issues can be fought out. And so I'm with you. I think we need to figure out either within the existing forum and take it over and really have a revolution or a separate forum which creates a model because right now what happens is that you're right. Something happens. Israelis decide that they're going to fight BDS on college campuses. They pass a resolution to fight BDS on college campus. They don't, they don't consult with any of us who are fighting BDS and pass a resolution that makes it harder for me to fight BDS in favor of a Jewish democratic state. So we need some kind of new forum. Do we fix the old? Do we, do we create a new one? I leave that to you. I'm just a Luftmensch, which is the great out. Uh, I'm going to let you decide who's picking and, and, and when we finish. Okay, because I saw the questions here too, so. I have a couple of short questions. Sure. Honestly, you talked about um, uh, the, you know, the usual suspects to crime, um, anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism in Washington, you know, people with names that are you know, related to ours. Um, so is it that we're not doing a good enough job in identifying the people who could speak up? And also, are we doing a good enough job of giving cabo to those who do? Like, for example, you know, Megan McCain, there was a lot of, of, of ache about her this weekend. And I thought, isn't that the kind of person we have to do? We have to make it more um, joyous for those, or less onerous for those who decry anti Semitism slash anti Semitism to speak up. Second question, not, not as inside baseball and as serious as the one that just was, but um, how do we make a more jo joyous Zionism? You know, how do we celebrate complexity for young people? And the last thing is, what is the one thing, if I said, what keeps you up at night? You obviously have a lot of mind. What is the one thing you can't shake out of your head in the middle of the night when you worry about the future of Israel and Jewish people? OK, thank you. Um, in the three hours remaining, those are all. Uh, so first of all, in terms of allies, my seventh commandment, thou shalt commit adultery. We do a terrible job. We're so busy in our, as you pointed, inside baseball, we're so busy in our inner ping pong that we don't, we don't branch out. And second of all, let's point out the quite literally elephant in the room, Donald Trump. 75% of the American Jewish community, I don't care, I know there's a range of opinions here, but 75% of the American Jewish community hates Donald Trump, abhors Donald Trump, detests Donald Trump. I call my best friend on the Upper West Side, I say, how's the weather? He said, did you see the latest tweet? And, and you know, you have to sp spend 10 minutes just sort of exercising that. And they're violating the Koch rule. And we saw this this week, that basically people were saying, this goes back to the women's march, uh, the first women's march. And by the way, good news, we always like the bad news. Look at the second women's march. There were women who said no, not just Jewish women. Women who said no, I, my hatred of Trump will not trump my hatred of anti-Semitism.
But this week, we saw too many people say, uh-uh, no, we've got we've to stay inside the anti-Trump camp. Um, and we also saw the reduction, the way when uh, Linda Sarsour tweets about Nancy Pelosi, and she reduces this complicated, interesting, some may love her, some may hate her, but she's a, a multidimensional woman who's been in Congress for 3,000 years um, or so, and re they, she reduces her to a white feminist who's perpetuating the patriarchy? Really? Isn't that a form of sexism? How come nobody called her out? Isn't that a form of bigotry? The only bigotry I learned about I never learned about a bigotry that says, oh, it depends on the color of your skin uh, or, and, and, and where you stand politically uh, to determine whether you're a bigot or not. What I learned about bigotry is if you essentialize, if you reduce somebody to the color of their skin, not the content of their character, Martin Luther King. If you reduce somebody to their religion, to their parents, to their grandparents, to who they are, to who they might be rather than who they are, that is bigotry. And why are we calling that out? And how have we allowed that to happen left and right? So uh, we have to deal with that, 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 that issue there. The joy is so easy. <laughs> you know, that, that, I'm, 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 I'm at uh, the Weizmann Institute in Rehovot, and we're having a birthright trip organizers meeting. And the dean gets up and he says, do you know that seven of the top 25 biotech drugs were invented here, three exclusively here in the Weizmann Institute, and f four others in partnership. So while he's speaking, I'm rude, I check out Dr. Google, and indeed it's true, because everything on the internet is true. I get up afterwards, and I say, Israel is a pimple on the skin of the world. Well, I think it's a beauty mark, but it's a pimple. The Weizmann Institute in Rehovot is one little pimple within that pimple. And you just heard seven of the top 25 biotech drugs were, were invented here, and you didn't stand up and sing Hatikva? So you know what I forced them to do? Stand up and sing Hatikva. We're not, we're, we're not taking advantages. And I, 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 look, I love Startup Nation, but I'm also afraid of Startup Nation. Because I won't say, oh, you know, they say occupation, and we say, oh, but we invented the internet. I mean, that doesn't work, especially with our young people. Right? And notice, I'm using the O word. Right? By the way, I take Yossi Klein Aleb before I, everybody strings me up. I take Yossi Klein Aleb's analysis, which is, it's our land too, so we cannot be occupying the land. But when you're in a situation where you are asserting military control over another people and they're not having the democratic rights, you gotta call it something, right? And I'd rather call it what it's called and then move beyond it than simply pretend, especially I'm gonna lose credibility with my college students, than, than, than simply, I'd rather make that nuance than, than, than look, I have no nuance. So I think, and I've seen that this, is, this has been, you, you asked me my low light, my high, the highlight of my year has been again and again sitting with people from the left and the right, religious, non-religious, in Israel, in Hebrew with my bad miftah, um, in South Africa, in Canada. I've done this, as I said, over 70 times, and I've watched people's eyes, and I've seen the texts, and I've seen that you simply just go back to the fundamentals, my 168 co-stars, and wow, magic happens. So we're not doing enough. If I really believed that we had the perfect educational opportunities that we were giving everybody and it wasn't working, I'd say, okay, we failed, but no. We can do better, and then we see it. What's, what keeps me up at night? I'll, I'll channel, I mentioned Yossi. Yossi would say, Iran, I, I, I worry about something else. I, I worry about everybody just walking away. <laughs> I worry about everybody just closing up shop, especially here in America. I worry about my, my best friends, my friends who I would take a bullet for, my buddies from Young Judea. Those who stayed here, those, I'm going to be very controversial because you asked me, those who left, who didn't go as many of us, as some of us did to the right religiously, those who entered the republic of everything, those who worshipped at the, the shrine of being so open-minded your brains fall out, their kids who are lovely and wonderful are so upset about white privilege they've forgotten Jewish patriotism. Somehow it wasn't passed on. And I worry about them. And I, I know I risk alienating some of my friends from the left, but I also know that I have some left-wing friends right here in this room who would take a bullet for Israel and are true Jewish patriots. So I know it's not a left-right issue. It often plays out as a left-right issue. But somehow or other, when I look at, again, I'm going to be controversial. I'm not allowed to say it. It's supposed to be an opportunity, not a problem. But when I look at 70% intermarriage rates, I accept the, the Len Sachs analysis that at the end of the day, it's not about politics, it's about identity. But I also have seen from birthright, and I've also seen from the Cohen Center studies, that it's not as bad as it looks. But somehow we only hear about the abandoning ship. But again, that, that big intermarriage number um, scares me. Because at the end of the day,
peoplehood, even when it comes to conversion, conversion classes don't pass on, they pass on the religion, they don't pass on the nation. And by the way, one of the things also we have to do, for those of you who are rabbis in the room, I think we have to improve our conversion classes. We have to make sure that we really steep people in what I call the Oreo cookie. What's the Oreo cookie? That Jews are uh, both a nation and a religion. The cookie part and the cream part. And my understanding as an outsider that too much of the conversion class is about, and especially the orthodox conversion class, is about getting the religion right, but you've got to get the people at peace. And you people are peoplehood patriots. And that's our opportunity as Zionists. Yes. Uh, I apologize. We have time for one last question. Okay. Behind. Sure. Oh, thank you very much. Very quick question. I run into people all the time, various agents who say they are now diasporists. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. So I'll 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 see you and 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 double that because I hear about the diasporists and I also hear about those people led by Frank Luntz who say Zionism doesn't poll well, right? Doesn't poll well. And there's no greater crime in modern America than not polling well. Right? And I always say, I'll answer that first and then go to, go to that one. I always say, yeah, you know, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement wouldn't have polled well in the 1950s, and feminism wouldn't have polled well in the 1960s, and the American Revolution wouldn't have polled well in the 1700s, and the Zionist movement certainly wouldn't have polled well in the 1800s, so I'm not going to buy the polls. And in fact, I learned from my feminist friends, and from my gay friends, and from my African American friends to take back the night. I learned from them that I don't let the other define me. And that's what happens if we say, oh, give up on the Zionism word because it's too unpopular, then what we're basically doing is we're giving the delegitimizers, the haters, a victory they don't deserve, and I'm not going to do that, not on my watch. No way. I'm still going to use that Zionist word loudly and proudly and say, I am a Zionist. And connected to that, I get it. American Jews are told to get it again, and American Jewish kids especially are told, you're the center of the universe. The whole world revolves, it's not just men, right? The whole world revolves around you. So God forbid, you should be told a counter-narrative that the promised land isn't what Mary Anton called the promised land in the 1880s in her novel about the golden Medina here, but the promised land is over there. It's actually a, a fundamental contradiction in the American Jewish soul because all the stories we tell is about our great-grandparents and our grandparents and our parents coming from the benighted old world to the new world. And that's the most, as an American historian, that's the, my most left-wing hypercritical American history friends basically have that assumption about America still as the center of the universe. And the Zionist narrative, I call this conflicting promised lands, takes us another way. My diasporist friends, I say go, as my mother would say, go ahead. But two things. One, you're missing the peoplehood piece. You're missing the opportunity to be a little humble and to learn about something else and somebody else. And two, find me a Jewish community Let's look at Germany um, in the 1830s and 1850s, let alone the 1930s. Let's look at France in the 1800s and 1900s. Find me a Jewish community that went out of the religious fold and also went out of the national fold, crumbled the, the, the Oreo cookie, because that's what you're doing. You're giving up on your religion and your nation and survived. I want to survive. But I don't just want to survive. I want to thrive. And with us working together, thinking together, thinking out of the box, dreaming together, we will. To Darabha. Gil, thank you very much. And a special thanks to our planning committee, to um, Francine Stein, our board chair, and Paul, Rabbi Paul Gollum, as well as to uh, Jan and Mindy, for working so hard on a superb program for coming up with a theme that fits for today, but it was a theme that they put together quite some time ago. Unity and community bringing together the many voices of Zionism. And then for focusing on each and every session to be sure we started right, to be sure we had meaningful points, meaningful ideas, meaningful opportunity for dialogue, and that we would have indeed a meaningful conference. The selection of a keynote is always very controversial. But there was no controversy among the American Zionist movement, Gil, as to who should be our keynote speaker. We selected you because we knew you would do what a keynote speaker really is charged to do. And that is give us vision Give us a path, give us hope, give us direction, 
and give us the ruach and the spirit and the commitment to do what is right and to do what we must do for our people. Gil Troy, you have done that, but you didn't just do it today. Your whole career has been dedicated to sharing Zionist ideas, and then you decided to write the new book. We thank you for having come. We want you to know that we hope you will remain at this table during lunch and will sign books. They're $25, including the signature. And uh, on the table is a handout sheet that Gil has prepared. He's given you his direct email, giltroy at gmail.com, as well as zionistideas.com, because Long before it became controversial, Gil Troy, you were telling us about the dangers of anti-Semitism and the connectivity between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, that narrow bridge of hate that emerges when we don't stand up and speak out strongly and proudly. So we thank you for being our keynote speaker. We thank you for your charge. We're very appreciative. And uh, in that spirit, we transition to um, hate stops here. The World Zionist Organization, under the chairmanship of our, the deputy chairman, uh, Yaakov Hagoel, has launched a program for today at this hour which now has 60 communities around the world gathering together with one message. Hate stops here. Say no to anti-Semitism and rally on March 10, 2019. So as we are here, people have gathered in Times Square under the banner of the World Zionist Organization. They've gathered in Australia, they've gathered around the world. What we're going to do in a moment, in a moment, is hear a message directly from Jerusalem from Yaakov Agoel. And then we're going to, if you wouldn't mind, you can take the elevator or climb the stairs. Everyone will have this mini poster, which is the same poster being used around the entire Jewish world today. AZM is the co-sponsor here in New York. And we're going to climb the stairs and our great photographer, and we thank you for being at all of our events the last two years, we appreciate it, is going to position us on the stairway so that AZM speaks strongly, loudly, and proudly. S hate stops here. Say no to anti-Semitism. Please, as we transition from Gil Troy, Please welcome Yaakov Hagoel from Yerushalayim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.